Hey guys, so today we're talking about European society and exploration. We're going to be talking about what is going to cause Europeans to leave Europe and explore new territories and what happens ultimately when we get when they get to those new territories and the effects it has on the people that are already there. So <clears throat> when we talk about European exploration, we are going to be talking about those different motivations of religiosity as well as the economic motivation and just the fact that like they have new technologies that can get there. So in talking about religious causes, we have to talk about things like the Crusades. The Crusades are going to be a series of religious sanctioned wars that are going to happen during the medieval times. You probably learned about this like in seventh grade. And they are going to be campaigning in um, the Eastern Mediter Mediterranean that they're trying to get their holy lands back from Muslim rule. And <clears throat> this is going to be this whole idea then of using religious perspective and religious argument in order to kind of go forth and wage war because it's all in the name of your religion. We also have to talk about the Reformation. The Reformation started from this handsome guy right here. Also, look at how straight that line was. Not the one up the part of the arrow, but the actual like line part of the arrow. Um, Martin Luther. Martin Luther is going to question the Catholic Church. So <clears throat> the Catholic Church, we have to talk about this. So everything belongs to Christianity, right? That's like the whole like head of it. And then it's going to split into the Western and the Eastern Church. Western meaning Western Europe, Eastern meaning Eastern Europe. And the Western Church is going to break into Catholicism and Protestantism. Catholicism is, as you know, Catholics today. If you're Catholic or you know someone who's Catholic, it is exactly the same, more or less. Protestants then are going to branch off into so many different types of Christianity that you see today when you talk about people who are brethren, people who are Methodist, people who are, I don't know, Unitarian, that they all kind of branch out from the Protestant side of things. Martin Luther is going to write this thing called the 95 Theses, and he is going to nail it to the church door, which like when I learned about this when I was your age, I was like, whoa, what a crazy guy nailing that to the church door, but they treat it like a bulletin board. So like there's already like a million other things out there and like, oh, Martin Luther's 95 Theses, whatever. Um, and he is going to question the Catholic Church. He's going to question them going on crusades. He's going to question the kind of hierarchy there is within the church and, you know, how much power the Pope has and, you know, selling indulgences of buying your way into heaven. And British Martin Luther is like, I don't think I believe in this. Like all the pomp and circumstances, like going around the Catholic Church and your saints and your deities, that like we need to kind of clean it up and get back to the basics and like really get into the Bible. And Martin Luther, what he's saying is just like profound. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, it's a whole different thing. And this is going to further kind of bring weight then for Europeans and trying to spread their religion and trying to get people to believe what they believe and also trying to um, make things happen. We are going to see expanding trade networks. So um, Europe is going to be getting new technologies, meaning like new types of sails and boats and things like that that are going to allow them to trade with places they hadn't traded with before. You are going to see that they are going to be having the emergence of a merchant class and that merchant class is going to be going to asia um, as well as some arab dominated trade routes and when they go there they're going to be getting things you can't get in europe they're going to be getting you know spices and silks and just all sorts of stuff and they're going to bring back with them you know mathematics and astronomy and different geography different maps literally um, and different ideas and these different ideas are going to spread across Europe and cause kind of an intellectual revolution. And the different goods are going to cause people to be like, hey, we want more of this stuff. Like, we like new stuff. And we like being able to know how to get to spices. And we like how rich we get from this stuff. So they're going to want ways to trade better. And they're going to have um, more encouragement to want to be able to find new trade routes and being able to support that. Columbus. Okay, so Christopher Columbus. He's going to be motivated, motivated by that religious piece. He's going to be motivated by making money. He's going to be motivated by trying to find new trade routes. And he's going to be motivated by just trying to be the biggest and the baddest around. And he is going to approach 
the Castilian monarchs of Ferdinand and Isabella, they're in Spain, and Christopher Columbus had gone to a variety of different people first. Let's just say that. And actually, Ferdinand and Isabella turned him down first. And then he was like, oh, so sad. They were literally the last ones on my list. Now there's nobody. Um, and ultimately, they're going to agree. They're like, hey, we're willing to give you money so you can go west. And when you go west, you're going to make it to India because that's where he thought he was going. Not the West Indies, to literally India. And that was a way for them to get a new trade route, to get rich and powerful, to be able to spread religion, and be able to get all those nice goods and bring them back to Europe. All the spices, right? And <clears throat> so Christopher Columbus sets off August 1492, and he's going to travel in three ships. They're going to travel 3,000 miles, and they do not end up in India. They end up in the present-day Bahamas, right up in here. And uh, land on an island that they call Hispaniola. And when they get there, they, they're like, ah, we managed the West Indies. Congratulations. This is fantastic. Um, and they're going to call the people there Indians, even though they're not Indians. And they're like, yes, where are your spices? And they're like, we don't know what you're talking about. And they don't have that much gold, but they're like, maybe there's something else there we can use that we can get rich off of. And they're really aren't that many opportunities of them making big, big bucks that they had expected to make if they made it all the way to the countries of India and West, the West Indies that they thought they were going to reach. This territory, though, is going to be very fertile, very good for growing things like tobacco, like cotton, like sugar. And this is going to spurn, it's going to cause people to want to come over there and grow things and make money off those crops. And <clears throat> this is going to encourage people to come this way. So we see the Spanish invasion. The Spanish were super obsessed with gold. That was what they were looking to get. And there was not a lot of gold on Hispaniola, um, but there was gold and South America, um, as well as more Southern North America, like Mexico and things like that. Um, so they're, they're going to probe into the mainland for the gold. And they're also going to be looking for slaves. They're going to be taking natives as slaves to sell. Um, you're going to see that they are going to be weakening, weakening the empires that are there in, oh, sorry to make it sound, <laughs> um, in North and South America at this point. And they are going to um, have the Spanish that are going to be replacing the system that's there with their own hierarchical system. This then brings us into a new American world. So as the Spanish are coming over, like I said, they're bringing their own kind of hierarchy and system with them. And part of the hierarchy and system are this thing called encomiendas. E-N-C-O-M-I-E-N-D-A-S. These encomiendas are going to be led by leading conquistadors. The conquistadors are the people from Spain who are the ones in charge going over and they are going to be taking over land. Sorry, that was just really aggressive. Um, and this land that they're taking over had been granted them by the crown. So the royal family had been like, yes, you may go take over land in another new territory that we don't actually own yet. And they are going to allow them to claim tribute to the conquistadors by land from labor and goods. Sorry, I was saying that backwards. So the land is the royal families. Conquistadors get the labor and goods. And... <clears throat> from the natives. And it is all okay to exploit the land and resources and everything because crusades, right? We're bringing Christianity to them and that is a-okay. You are gonna see that the um, metals, the precious metals of gold and silver are coming from Mexico as well, kind of the Andes Mountains are gonna pour into Spain and the Spaniards are gonna spend this newfound wealth on Eastern silks, spices, ceramics, um, going to the Catholic Church, things like that. And actually, there is so much gold and silver going in Spain at this point, it causes inflation, which is really bad for an economy. And you're going to see that the society in New Spain, that's the new territory that took over in North and South America, between 1500 and 1650 is going to have 350,000 Spaniards. Two-thirds of them are going to be men. Then it's going to have... 250 to 300,000 Africans that are going to migrate into Mesoamerica. 
and then you're going to see that there's racial mixing 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 that will be happening um, that is going to create a caste system uh, in New Spain based on your racial and ethnic makeup of how much Spanish you are, how much African you are, and how much native you are, and how that combines together where you fit into their caste system. And that's going to dominate your life and what they can do and all that. And conversion to Christianity is a huge push in New Spain. Okay, so we can't not talk about this without talking about the Columbian Exchange. The Columbian Exchange is going to be that literal exchange of goods that is happening from Europe into the New World, the New World meaning North and South America. The biggest thing that is going to be brought over are going to be the diseases that are going to be brought over from Europe into the New World. These diseases are things like smallpox, things like, I don't know, rubella, that are going to be completely decimating the native populations. We are not entirely sure the exact numbers of how many natives died off from this. Um, we think that by like 50 years to 100 years after Europeans first arrived into North and South America, that the native population was like one sixth um, of the people alive because of the diseases. And I know I was like, well, how does these diseases get around so fast? Like they're not going to shopping malls, coughing on each other. It's because of animals. Animals are moving around a whole time and animals are also carrying diseases with them. And now everyone's getting sick and dying real quick. Um, there is only one disease that comes from North and South America over to, the, to Europe. And that is going to be a virulent strain of syphilis will be coming across. Um, so for food and plants, we're going to have maize, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes and tomatoes that are going to be coming into um, Europe, you're going to see there's going to be increased agricultural yields and population growth in other continents because of this new food. You're going to see the exchange of cattle, swine, horses is an important one that's going to come over from Europe into North and South America that is going to largely change a lot of North American, especially North American um, natives way of life and what, how they're doing things, especially hunting. And very last, well, last thing of information I have for you. So this is just a timeline to give you an idea of where the Spanish settling into North and South America is compared to when the English are going to come. The English are the ones that we're most concerned with because they are going to be come the 13 colonies, 13 colonies, then it comes to the United States of America. So that's the one we're going to focus in on. But you're going to see Spain is going to come over and start their colonies in 1520. So it's almost 100 years before the English start settling here. Okay, analysis question. So now that we have answered everything in the middle part here, whoop, you have gotten the basics of information of what's going on for each of them and all that wonderful stuff. Now we're going to use your beautiful brain and analysis to answer the questions that are off to the side here. Um, being able to how, see how all of it goes together. We are going to be debating whether or not Christopher Columbus can be perceived as a hero or a villain. So think about it from both perspectives. Think about, the, thinks about, think about the points of view that go into it. Think about how Europeans view him versus how natives view him. Think about the causes of why he did what he did, the effects of it. And think about historical context. Think about the time and the place that Christopher Columbus is doing these things and how that might change our perception of it and how that might change how things are viewed. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to sign up for Q time right there. To come in to see me before or after school or just to ask it in class because someone else might have the same question as you and they need to know the answer just as much as you do. Um, I hope you enjoyed this beautiful lecture.